In this narrated lecture, we'll be talking about geologic time and absolute age dating. At the conclusion of this lecture, you should be able to uh, tell me or tell someone the age of the Earth, uh, the fundamentals of radioactive uh, isotopic age dating, and how these um, age dating processes are used to understand the age of the Earth. Here is the geologic time scale that we discussed in talking about relative age dating. And through relative age dating, geologists developed the scale that's shown in the orange box um, by correlating, by using the principles um, of relative age dating and doing a lot of work across uh, the whole world to come up with these um, these relative ages. Now what they didn't have then was the actual absolute ages of these features. And so that's the goal of this lecture is to show you how that's developed. If you can remember, we used relative age dating principles to come up with a sequence of events that would explain our observations about crops like this. So we used the, the principle of superposition to establish the older rocks are down here, the younger rocks are here. We recognize the location of unconformities, these rocks are tilted, and here is the angular unconformity. We recognize disconformities, a break in the geologic record between sedimentary rocks. And finally, we use cross-cutting relationships to determine that this um, harder rock, this basalt, this dike, is actually younger than all these other features. So those were the principles we used to determine order of events. And we could get more complicated. This is a diagram that you should feel somewhat comfortable with developing uh, a sequence of events in order to determine um, the geologic history of this, of this area or of this model. But being scientists and being curious, um, just knowing the relative sequence of things is just not enough. What we really need are the actual years that are represented by these geologic features. As shown in the previous lecture, many people have been thinking about uh, the geologic time and how to uh, gauge geologic time um, with some success in getting some uh, actual ages. But it wasn't really until the 1900s with the discovery of radioactivity uh, and uh, half-life of isotopes and then the applications to geology did the uh, development of the numeric ages of the Earth's history really come in to light. So we'll be talking about that the rest of the lecture. So here are some basics for absolute age dating. First of all, atoms uh, are um, a fundamental particle of matter. They consist of protons and neutrons in the nucleus and electrons that orbit the nucleus. The protons and neutrons are responsible for most of the mass of the atom, the electrons for most of the volume. And remember, this is just the model of what an atom looks like. The number of protons and electrons for any element are fixed, and that is equal to the atomic number for that element. The number of neutro neutrons can differ, however, and the number of neutrons plus the number of protons give us the atomic mass, and because we can have changes in the number of neutrons, uh, the atomic mass can change, which is a good thing because we're going to use this in order to separate um, different uh, isotopes of atoms. Um, they're a different mass. So here is carbon. Carbon-12 has six protons, six neutrons, 13, 6, 7, 14, 6, and 8, and uh, then to nitrogen, which is a different element, so it has a different number of protons um, and a different number of neutrons. Okay. So the variation in neutrons is called the, uh, an isotope. So carbon has how many isotopes? It has three, 12, 13, and 14. Now some of the isotopes are radioactive. 
such as carbon-14. And what that means is that, notice that's a very small percentage of all carbon atoms. Most carbon atoms are carbon-12. But what radioactive means is that they undergo spontaneous change. They're unstable and they undergo spontaneous change by losing some um, particle from the nucleus. And this is a radioactive decay and as a result it changes into a different atom because it has a different proton. Now fundamentally what this means for our purposes is that if we can document how fast this occurs and we can measure the amount of starting material measure the amount of ending material, we can come up with how long it took for the carbon to change into the nitrogen. So that's our clock, our geologic clock. So let's look at an example of this. This is very idealized. Okay, so at starting time, okay, first of all, let's go over to the legend here and see what we got. So there are two types of isotopes. There are a parent isotope and a daughter isotope. Now the daughter isotope is one that uh, forms as a result of radioactive decay of the parent isotope. So our data here is going to show total atoms, parent plus daughter, the atoms of the parent, and the atoms of the daughter. So what's going to happen is as radioactive decay continues, the number of parent atoms will decrease and the number of daughter atoms will increase. Okay, here we go. Starting time, no daughter. 64 million atoms of parent. Okay. So after one month, we have a decay. The parent atoms are, are decreasing and they turn into the daughter isotope. After two months, the change continues in a linear fashion. After four months, we get half and half. Okay. That's shown on this graph. Okay, so you notice the curve and the pie charts, so all parent, half and half, daughter, three quarter daughter, one quarter parent, and et cetera. So it breaks down, uh, not breaks down, but the parent decays into the daughter over time. So this value when it's half and half is an important um, value and it's called the half-life. And so for this idealized model, the half-life of this isotope, of the parent isotope is is uh, four months. With continued decay, the curves start to flatten. Uh, we're getting fewer, we have fewer parent, um, but because it's only decaying by half each time, um, it's going to become uh, parallel to the axis, so we'll never lose, or we could lose all the parent, but it's very unlikely. But the important thing to note in this is this value right here, the half-life. When everything is equal, we call that the half-life for this isotope. So let's use this as an example. So let's assume that for these minerals, or this, uh, yeah, this mineral, we've analyzed the mineral using a thing called a mass spectrometer, and we've determined that at this time there are 10 million parent atoms and 30 million daughter atoms within that mineral. Therefore, the total parent atoms at the start is 10 plus 30, is 40 million atoms. Okay. So, after one half-life, 40 million parents go down to 20 million parents. Okay, so you have 20 million parent and 20 million uh, daughter. After a second half-life, the 20 gets cut in half to a 10. And so we have two half-lives, 40 to 20, and then th this 20 down to 10. Note now we have a match between the number of parent atoms in the sample and the number of parents after, ha after two half-lives. So if it was one half-life, it would be four months. That sample would be four months old. But since we have two half-lives that have occurred, the um, mineral has an age of eight months. Okay, so here's that graph again. Half-life is four months, so two half-lives must be eight months. So that is a, a very simple um, way that this age dating works. There are, of course, some caveats uh, that have to be attended to uh, for absolute age dating. Um, so half-life is our geologic clock. 
And as I said before, this is the time it takes for half of the radioactive parent atoms to change, that is, parent to daughter. In order to use half-life um, as a geologic clock, we need to know the half-life of isotopes, which we know very accurately, and your book covers that in some detail. We need to be able to measure parent and daughter isotopes, which you can also measure very accurately, so that's not a problem. We also have to assume that the change is spontaneous and not dependent on temperature or pressure, which has been shown to be true as well. However, the, the clock, our geologic clock, may be reset by changing physical conditions, such as the introduction of fluids and or changes in temperature. What this might do is to change the amount of daughter or parent uh, atoms within the sample. When we're dating um, uh, rocks, mostly igneous and metamorphic rocks, what we're really dating is the minerals in them. We're not actually dating the entire rock. And so in order to understand what that date means, we need to know the context. Uh, for example, if we're dating an igneous mineral, we, need, we will be actually dating the crystallization of that mineral. If we're dating a metamorphic mineral, uh, what we're actually dating is the metamorphism that's occurring. We also be able to have to choose the appropriate method. For example, uh, a common isotopic system that people know is carbon dating, which uses the isotope carbon-14. And uh, this is not a good isotopic system for old rocks because over time, all of the carbon-14 uh, is changed into nitrogen, and uh, therefore we can't measure any of the parent. So we have to choose an appropriate method, depending on the context. There are also some assumptions related to absolute age dating. Our first assumption is that, that there's no daughter isotope atoms present when the rock forms. There are no parent isotopes are lost when the rock forms or when the mineral forms, so we can measure those. And finally, there are no daughter isotopes are lost or gained from the rock once it forms and decay begins. And when these assumptions aren't uh, met for some systems, Usually another system is used to check the results. So this is a, uh, a pretty robust process of determining the age of uh, geologic processes. This slide shows a table of the methods of uh, radioactive dating, the isotopes that are used, the half-life, what can be dated by them, and then the age range of applications. The important thing to realize here is that some methods, like the carbon-14 method, which has a very short half-life, aren't going to be really good for rocks because rocks are much older than that and all of the parent will be gone from that sample over geologic time. So notice that we can use a variety of means, and this is just a limited list of samples or of techniques, excuse me, um, to date geologic features. And so uh, one of the checks on uh, the accuracy of radioactive dating is that they, we can use several different methods and um, typically come up with the same result. So here is one uh, test of the radioactive age dating process. Um, and let's look at this graph in some detail. Here is the age calculated by carbon-14 age dating. Here's the known age based on historical records. So if there's a perfect match, they will fall along that line. Uh, and as you can see, the error bars uh, intersect for the most part, except for this uh, one down here, or very close, or even right on to a line of slope equal of one. So this, is, uh, this gives us some pretty good confidence that the technique of using carbon isotopes to date young materials is pretty robust. That is, it, it brings good results. Here's another test. Uh, it's more diagrammatic in nature. Um, but if we know the age of the two intrusions, um, then uh, we can determine that if the inclusions here are younger than intrusion B, then we have some confidence 
that the age dating process is, uh, is robust and, uh, and accurate. So that's another test of the process. In the next set of slides, uh, we'll be going through uh, understanding how isotopic clocks can be reset uh, during different geologic processes and also what the uh, isotopes tell us in terms of the timing um, or the context in which they are uh, set. So let's have a look at this. It kind of resembles the rock cycle in some ways. So here we go. So let's first start out with igneous rocks. So here we have some magma which is crystallizing and during that crystallizing process um, all of the argon gas escapes to the surface. Oh, and I, I meant to say that we're going to be focusing on the potassium argon age dating system. The potassium is incorporated into crystallizing minerals and the isotopic clock is set to zero when all of the argon is gone. So this doesn't uh, change the isotope ratio because the potassium changes to argon. So the minerals here, uh, as it starts to cool, continue to lose uh, argon um, until less than 400 degrees. And that's when the clock starts and the minerals start accumulating both potassium and argon. And notice that the argon is formed by decay. So here's where the clock starts, less than 400 degrees. So when this rock reaches the surface, um, some weathering may cause loss of potassium argon, um, although the isotopic clock does uh, keep running. And so we're still getting an idea of the age of the crystallization of these minerals. So the next step in this process is the sedimentary rock process. So um, within the minerals in the older rock, the isotopic clock is, is continuing to run. So we're continuing to change the potassium and argon ratios and getting an age, we'll be getting an age from this rock once we uh, sample it. And there's a new process occurring and that is the formation of uh, minerals that cement the fragments together. And so now we have a new isotopic clock forming that's based not on the minerals from the older rocks, but on the sedimentary uh, processes. So if we can separate these minerals out and these minerals out, we can get two ages, the age of the crystallization and the age of the cementation. And that's, that's pretty powerful. So on to the metamorphic part of this cycle. Um, when metamorphism starts, what usually happens is the clock is reset. All the argon escapes do, during metamorphism is carried off by fluid. And so, and there are new minerals forming that contain potassium like muscovite and biotite and feldspars. And so the isotopic clock is reset and then when uh, the rock cools below a temperature where the argon and potassium are captured within the minerals, that's when the clock starts again and we start retaining the argon so that when we sample this metamorphic rock, we'll be sampling it based on when the collection of the argon started, uh, and therefore we'll be sampling um, the metamorphic processes. So that uh, series of slides shows the connection to the different rock types and the rock forming processes. So let's go back to our more static situation where we have a set of an outcrop with an igneous dike. Now, typically it's hard to date sedimentary rocks except in some occasions. Uh, and when we date grains within these sedimentary rocks, we're actually probably dating the age uh, that those grains formed. But when we have an igneous dike cross-cutting those, um, we can measure the potassium and argon ratio, which here is 0.0015. And then when we plot that in, we have this uh, line that's dictated by the, ha um, the half-life of the potassium argon system. And when we plug that in, we get an age of 25.8 million years just for this part of this outcrop. So what that means is that this whole package of rocks has to be younger than 25.8 million years. The fact that we can only date certain rocks is also reflected in this uh, slide of a package of sedimentary rocks which has a basaltic flow which is parallel to the sedimentary layering 
and a volcanic ash bed, which is also parallel to sedimentary layering. Now, through relative age dating and faunal succession, superposition principles, so, so forth, we were able to document uh, a relative age for these rock layers, and, given, and we were able to give them names. Now, with dating the basalt, we were able to get an absolute age, 385, um, and with the volcanic ash, 325, and using the fossils here, changing across this boundary, we can make, a, make an estimate that this age boundary is about halfway between 385 and 325, or around 355 million years old. So what's not changing is the fossil record and the principles we're using, like of superposition. But what does change as we get more precision and we're able to date more types of rocks is the precision of what this age boundary is. So, um, and there's never been a case where the age boundaries have dramatically gone, uh, have, have changed. They've just been further and further refined as we get better at doing this. So now we can combine relative and absolute age dating to produce a pretty accurate story um, for this, um, this model or this diagram that we made in the field that shows a bunch of sedimentary layers uh, and a cross-cutting igneous dike. We can interpret um, the depositional environment for these layers. We can note the presence of disconform or, uh, angular unconformities. We can notice non-conformities and definitely changes in depositional environment as we go across. And your book um, on page 275 goes through a pretty good narrative of how this is done, and I encourage you to read through this. Um, this is the real work that geologist does, and uh, it's pretty interesting. So that's it for geologic time. I wanted to end with a picture of where the rock, the oldest rock in the world, came from at 4.6 billion year old zircon found in these metamorphic rocks from the Hudson Bay. Uh, and here's our home here in Corvallis in the Hudson Bay, located over here in Canada. Um, this is one of the great scientific stories, the, um, starting off with developing um, through really careful, detailed observations of sedimentary rocks, um, a story that started uh, being developed in the 1800s and then moving up to the present where we can use uh, really precise and accurate uh, instruments to measure isotopes and come up with accurate ages for Earth processes and the age of the Earth. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask.